Hey everybody, welcome to the Black Carnivore Podcast. I am so excited to share today's conversation with you. Dr. Anthony Chaffee is just fascinating. Oh my God. So he is a doctor, a medical doctor, uh, currently living in Australia. And uh, he is also a former professional rugby player, so very much an athlete. And he has been doing carnivore for more more than a decade. Um, so he's very, actually, very familiar with this way of eating, and um, and has dived into the science of it. He's basically developed his own poison theory of chronic disease. So you know, the main chronic diseases that are killing people in the United States and probably around the world is uh, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, stroke and uh, cancer. And uh, many people, well, some people in our space are starting to talk about how um, those conditions are actually lifestyle conditions and they are due, you know, solely to the way that we are eating and we are living. And um, so Dr. Anthony Chaffee, he talks a lot about, you know, the disease, um, well, the poisons that are in the plant foods that we're eating and the actual impact they're having on our bodies. But what was so interesting about today's conversation is not only did we talk about that, but we really applied it to the black community. What does this mean for black people? Um, why are we struggling so much more than other people, uh, you know, with these same diseases? You know, why do, when you look at, um, you know, when you compare, uh, you know, black people with diabetes versus white people with diabetes in the same neighborhoods, in the same area, um, who are in the same, you know, socioeconomic background, uh, uh, bracket and have the same access to medical care, you still find that black diabetes, diabetes patients are, um, you know, they're as suffering with an amputations far more than the, the, their white counterparts. So, you know, so what's going on? And, um, and I don't think enough people are asking these kinds of questions. And um, so, you know, I put them to Dr. Chaffee. Uh, I don't know that there are answers necessarily, but, you know, to, you, can't, you can't even start answering questions until you start asking questions. So uh, that was a lot of our conversation today. He brought in, um, you know, some of the um, information uh, about, you know, the Aboriginal population in uh, Australia and um, talking about... Uh, you know, some of the um, ancestral eating patterns in Africa. So it was really fascinating. And he was so, so generous with his time that we ended up talking for like two and a half hours. So I'm not giving you all that tonight. So tonight we're just going to do part one. And um, I, I hope that you are fascinated and, um, and you know, and, and like can't wait till next week when you um, get, get to see part two. But anyway, enjoy, and uh, here we go. I'm, I'm really excited to, to get this opportunity to talk to you. I'm always interested in hearing from uh, experts and uh, you know doctors and medical professionals who consider this way of eating viable. Um, I've seen so much benefit for myself and and for the people that I work with. So I you know I'm always interested to hear like why, <laughs> yeah. how it works. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, if you could tell me a little bit more about yourself and, and how you came to, um, you know, to, to try this way of eating. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Um, yeah, so, so for me, it was, it was a bit of a, a roundabout way. I didn't, you know, hear about the carnivore diet. As, as a carnivore diet per se, I didn't, uh, you know, have any health issues that I was trying to correct. I just, you know, I played sports since I was a kid and I was always interested in medicine and taking science classes. And so nutrition was just a, a natural interest of mine because I was interested in how the body worked, but also how to best fuel myself in athletics. And then when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, 20 plus years ago, we were, were learning about the different carcinogens that, that exist and just things we eat every day and specifically the different you know, plants and vegetables that use natural defenses and chemicals to defend themselves. And you know, this is something that you know, I actually learned when I was in seventh or eighth grade biology that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race plants becoming more and more poisonous. So less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. Otherwise they go extinct. And then animals becoming more adapted to specific poisons in specific plants so they can eat that specific plant and survive and thrive. And that becomes their dedicated food source. They don't have to compete for resources. 
And so they have the ability to break those poisons down safely. And so then the carnivores who can't do that with plants are then able to eat that animal, that herbivore, and those, those poisons, those toxins have already been filtered out and broken down safely. So it's, it's safe for them. Um, we were learning this from a cancer perspective. So looking specifically at carcinogens, and we were taught that things like Brussels sprouts had 136 already identified human carcinogens. Mushrooms had over hundred, just you know, white mushrooms had over hundred. Spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, all the different vegetables that, that you would expect to find in a store, we were given lists of these and they had 60, 80 or over hundred known human carcinogens each and they were quite abundant. We knew since the 1980s from research out of UC Berkeley, uh, from Professor Bruce Ames that you know there were 10,000 times more naturally occurring poisons in vegetables like spinach than the pesticides we were spraying on them. This was this was because they were trying to outlaw pesticides. They said these are these are dangerous. We should get rid of them. And he sort of pointed out that we've been using pesticides for 80 years without any sort of issue that it probably wouldn't be causing any new issues. And so he did the studies and he showed that that actually 99.99% of the poisons in plants or pesticides, insecticides in plants are naturally occurring. And this is why we still have pesticides. And so, and they, and they were actually quite a lot more toxic and they were much more likely to cause cancer in, in animal models that he did than the pesticides. And so, you know, we still have pesticides. So we were, we were quite taken aback by that. I remember just looking around wildly, like, okay, there must be a TA or someone just that, you know, on the joke, you know, like, oh, he does this every year. And, and there wasn't, and it was a very, very sort of surreal moment to me that this, I'm like, this guy is serious. We were all just looking around wildly. And I remember thinking to, in myself, my head, I was like, well, but, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he just, you know, must've read our minds because he looked at us and just said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I was like, right, screw plants. And I just stopped like that day, went to the grocery store and was just, just walking through the aisles, just trying to find something that didn't have a plant, but it was the entire store was just, just plants and, and plant-based products, you know, you know, bread and, and uh, pasta, obviously main staples, rice, but even, even like mixed bags of uh, ready-made meals would always have some sort of plants or, or uh, vegetables in them, fruit, obviously. And then the produce aisle was completely out, but then I was just walking around. I was just like, okay, I guess eggs, the eggs don't come from a plant, meat, meat doesn't come from a plant, milk, milk doesn't come from a plant. And so I just ate eggs, meat and milk for five years. At that point, I was playing, you know, rugby at, you know, university level and a men's level. And you know, I was playing in the you know Canadian premier league. I was, you know, an all American. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, training with all-star teams and, and the national team and then played professionally in England. And I, that whole time I was only eating eggs, meat, and milk sometimes, but mostly, mostly eggs, meat, and milk. And I, I was absolutely uh, in the best shape I've ever been in my entire life. I remember just training so hard for so long. And, you know, obviously it took a while to build up, but I got to a point where I, I literally couldn't get tired from my training as I would train, you know, I'd, I'd be in, in college until, you know, three o'clock and I'd be at training at three 30 and I would train until about nine o'clock uh, with rugby. And then I, you know, go to the gym afterwards. I couldn't get tired. I did that every single day. I would play at least two games on the weekend, sometimes three or four, because I just, I just wanted to keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. And I, I literally couldn't get tired. And, and so I was just in, in the same shape. I remember thinking to myself, I was like, I should just enter a marathon because like, I can literally just sprint the whole thing and not get tired. I'm just like, you know, shatter records in my first marathon ever, but it just sounded like the most boring thing in the world to do. So I just never going to do it. But I, I remember thinking to myself, I'm, I'm going to really regret this if I don't do that, just to show exactly how good of shape I was in. And I do I absolutely regret it. But, um, you know, when I was but in England, you, sorry? I, I mean, I, I have so many questions, like you've really just blown my mind with the things that you said. So I want to come back. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But I, before That's we fine. got off of the plants, like, Oh my gosh, what arms race? Like I, you know, I've been familiar with the idea that, you know, plants have a chemical defense system and that that is what is, um, what, what can be irritating for some of us and why some of us do better on carnivore. But um, mm -hmm. one, I didn't imagine that plant, plants are actually becoming more poisonous. Um, yeah. Like it just, 
didn't occur to me, but of course, I mean, things evolve. <laughs> like why, I don't know why I didn't even think about that. Um, and that, you know, most of the, the carcinogens, are you saying that most of the carcinogens in plants are endogenous rather than the pesticide mm. that we are spraying on them? Yeah, far more, far more by weight and number and, uh, you know, you know, uh, um, and efficacy, like they're, they are worse for you. And so there, there's more of them by weight. And, you know, I, I don't know, like each specific molecule, whether it's more or less uh, carcinogenic, but, you know, on the whole, the naturally occurring pesticides and insecticides that are in plants, plants are, are far more likely to cause cancer in, in animal models. Obviously, we don't have these in, in human models, it wouldn't be ethical. But uh, yeah, so that, yeah, they're far more likely to cause cancer. So then how are there these studies that say, you know, I don't know, 10 pounds of Brussels sprouts a day will, will cure stomach cancer. I mean, how, how yeah. do we have these studies that say plants have a beneficial impact on cancer? Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's the thing. So you have to have to sort of look at the source and, and see who's making the study and, and actually just look at the study. Uh, there's so many studies out there. And as, as a lot of people uh, know, it's just if you, you can get a study that concludes basically anything you want, you can find a headline that proves your point. And so you have to look past the headline, you have to, you have to read the whole study. And if you look at the methodology, if you look at the results, you have to say, okay, was this powered enough? Were there enough people? Did they actually do an experiment? What, what, what were their, uh, what was their, 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 you know, study, you know, um, how was it modeled? And, and was this actually going to answer the question that they set out to, to answer and did it, you know, I, I've read so many studies that their conclusions are completely, uh, you know, off base from their own studies. And, and a lot of these studies get misrepresented as well. I mean, uh, think about it this way. Uh, there's something called the, the Framingham study, which is, which is one of the cardinal studies in, in cardiology, proving that cholesterol causes heart disease, where in fact, it never did that. Um, the only thing that you could say is that maybe it showed an association or a correlation and correlation is not causation. But the thing is, is it never actually did. It never actually showed even a correlation with heart disease. In fact, it showed that um, as you dropped your cholesterol level, your, your incidence of, you know, like, like death and things like that actually went up. So it was, it was actually, they found that cholesterol was protective. So the AHA, um, the American Heart Association, two years after this was published, actually completely misrepresented it, misrepresented those, those results and, and said it was the other way around that, that, you know, as you increase cholesterol, you have, you have a higher risk of dying and, you know, by certain percentage points, I forget the exact, I, I have it written down, but I, I don't um, know it offhand, but they, literally the exact opposite. And that's what people ran with. And that's what made the headlines. And that's actually what was taught in medical schools. It's actually shocking that this, this is what the, the misrepresentation of that study is actually what was taught to me in medical school. And, you know, so you have to look at the studies themselves. They say very different things. As far as, you know, specific studies looking at, you know, vegetables and plants being good for you, a lot of these things are, are based in epidemiological uh, nutrition, which is it's just not even science. I mean, it's very, very, very bad stuff. You're looking at associations only. I mean, you can't do a controlled experiment, you know, for dozens of years with thousands of people in, in exact similar, you know, exact situations. It's just, it's not ethical. You can do that with animals. You can't do that with, with people. It also would just take a very, very long time. And so it doesn't, it doesn't work. And so you're looking for these associative sort of um, studies and you can just get anything you want. You have, you know, a few people doing a few things and you say, oh, it must've been the Brussels sprouts. And, and you, you can't really control for all these different sorts of factors, all these different confounding factors. So a lot of these studies that said that, you know, meat, you know, had a increased correlate, they would say it causes bowel cancer, but that never did. There was no study ever showing any cause causation between uh, red meat and bowel cancer. The, there was an epidemiological study that was completely biased. You go back and look, they, they cherry picked out the data that they wanted to use. And they only found a small increase, like an 18% increase, you know, correlation between people who ate meat and bowel cancer. And, and this wasn't even just, you know, carnivores, people doing what I do. This was people that just said, yeah, I eat meat sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. and then the people who eat, ate less than that, oh, they, they have less bowel cancer. They didn't control for anything else, and it was only an 18% increased correlation. And 
in epidemiolo epidemiology, you, re you really don't even pay attention until it's like a 200% increase. You say, okay, look, there's a stronger association here. Maybe let's pay attention to that. Smoking, for example, there are, there's no study showing causation between smoking and lung cancer, but there is a 2000% increased association, 2000%, it's not an 18%. So there's a very strong uh, association between people who smoke and people who get lung cancer. And so that is, that's a better study. You're like, okay, that's stronger evidence. It's not proof. It's not showing causation, but it's much more likely. And now these guys are saying, oh yeah, it's the same sort of sort of study we use for smoking. Same, same, not even close. This is 18% versus 2000%. And in fact, when people went and corrected for a lot of these confounding factors, they, they didn't even find an 18% increased correlation. And so there actually have been other studies that have been more uh, well-designed that and follow people for years and years and years and people that ate a lot of vegetables as well. They actually didn't find any benefit to uh, cancer rates or cancer survival for people who ate a lot of fruits and vegetables. They found no, no, no uh, increased survival at all. So people make these claims and they, and they say that, but it's actually not based on anything. And anytime someone says that, you know, just be like, okay, show me mm -hmm. what's your evidence. What, why, what are you basing that on? Oh, well, everyone knows. No, that's not how that works. You know, what's the well, study? Yeah, that's resume? what we hear all the time. Everybody yeah. says. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but you know, everyone knew the earth was flat too. How'd that one work out? You yeah. Know? I mean, th things change all the time. Our, our understanding of things change all the time. And there was a time that doctors actually recommended people smoke and drink alcohol for your health. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, the, the phrase, you know, don't blow smoke up my ass, sorry for the, you know, crude language, that actually came because there was, there was a medical procedure where they would actually pipe in through a tube smoke into people's rectums. And this was supposed to help with, you know, IBD. And, um, and so that was obviously not a good, <laughs> a good idea. And so the people were just like, yo, yo, don't, don't, don't blow smoke. Yeah. That's where that comes from. And so there are a lot of really dumb things. We used to use leeches all the time. We still use leeches, but very, very specific and controlled uh, times when you have like, you know, an area that's, that's just not draining blood properly. And you put some leeches on there to drain off the blood. If you're doing like, if you're transposing one piece of body to another piece of body to reconstruct it, sometimes you would use leeches as a last resort. Um, you know, I, I, we did that when I was doing plastics at Duke as a medical student. And, but they used to wow. use leeches for everything. They usually use leeches for absolutely everything. And there was, it was a whole, you know, college of medicine, you know, to do with leeching. And, and there were all these government, you know, and, and official guidelines, you know, saying, oh, this is, this is what you do. And you use leeches and these, and these sorts of things. And if you buck that system, you would absolutely be an outcast in the society of, of doctors, just like now when people point out rightly that there was absolutely no evidence ever to show that cholesterol caused heart disease or even was associated with heart disease because it's not. There is, isn't even a correlation between mm -hmm. uh, increased LDL cholesterol, saturated fat and, and heart disease, not even a correlation. And if you suggest that, the people who just haven't kept up with the literature are like, that's appalling that you would say that. Even doctors, right. I mean, like they just don't know yet. And like, and, and to me, it's just like, you're seven years behind the literature, man. Like, yeah. you know, don't look at me. <laughs> you know, you're the one who's not doing his homework. Well, let me ask another question. So what about the people who say that there's a hermetic response um, or, you know, went to eating vegetables or poisons, essentially, that um, a little bit of it makes you a little stronger and better? Like, what do you say to that? No, I mean, I, I would like to see their evidence for that, you know, maybe. Okay. Could be. But, you know, what are you basing that on? It's a, it, you know, if it's a guess, that's fine. Test it. You know, see what happens. But, you know, you can't just, you, you, you can't just say that. And oh, you know, I, I bet it is. I'm like, okay, well, I bet it isn't. So prove me wrong, you know. And um, you know, we see these things, and we see that they cause damage. You know, I mean, to to, to that end, though, I mean, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, there have been some studies, and they're, they're, again, they're not controlled trials or anything like that, showing that you know, very, very like micro doses of arsenic can actually confer some benefits in certain circumstances. Okay, but that doesn't mean that arsenic's good for you, right? But so maybe, but you, know, you, need to, you need to actually show some very strong evidence before I go drinking arsenic. 
And uh, well, I you know, guess I'm, people could argue that, like, I mean, that's kind of how your immune system works. You get exposed to stuff, and what doesn't kill you, you make you get a little stronger. So, is that like the same concept there, but not not correct? Or you know, I mean, potentially, um, but I would again, you know, want want to see the evidence for it. You know, mm-hmm. and you know, if you're, and and the thing is too, is that you don't you don't know how little you'll, you'll need in order to give a, a positive response and how much is, is, is just tipping the balance. And so, you know, people say like, well, you, you know, you keep, uh, you know, metabolic sort of flexibility. And, you know, if I eat this stuff now, that means I can eat it later. I'm like, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that you wouldn't have that ability later on. Like we have, you know, our, our liver uh, is, is, you know, an amazing organ and it is able to break down a lot of, you know, harmful things. And there's nothing to suggest that it can't do that, you know, without constant exposure. Now you can build up a tolerance, just like you'd build up a tolerance to alcohol, you can build up a tolerance to other toxins. And so that's fine, but you know, it, you're not completely protected from it. You are still getting harmed by this stuff. You know, some of the stuff is getting through and you can overload your liver as well. And eventually this stuff is all, is all spilling through. So this is going to affect your health. It's going to affect your health negatively. If you're exposed to this poison continuously, yes, you know, you'll, it will take more of that poison to, uh, you know, get past your defenses once they're built up. And now, you know, I don't have as many defenses because my body sort of tamped those down. I don't have, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the tolerance that I would. And so if I get sort of different things in my food, I, I feel it a lot more than I would have. And also there's a contrast because I just feel so much better now. And now that takes me down a notch and I'm like, Ooh, I don't like that. And so I notice it uh, more readily, but also, you know, I, I may not have the tolerance for that, but you know, I haven't, I haven't seen anybody provide a single shred of evidence to say that, you know, constant exposure to these harmful toxins uh, is good for you. And also, I mean, there's just tens of thousands of these things. And I, you know, I did a whole hour long video, just, just talking about all the different ways that, you know, plants, uh, you know, you use chemical defenses, all different classes of, of, uh, of chemicals they use against you. Well, but- for everybody watching, I'm going to link that video. Cause I am absolutely fascinated by this. And I know you <laughs> all are going to want to watch this too. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, but you have to realize, I mean, think about, you know, every herbivore in the world, you know, they eat very specific plants. They don't eat a large number of them. And so they have the, you know, they have the defenses for the poisons in, in those plants. So maybe that one plant, like a koala and eucalyptus or a panda and, and bamboo, you know, all other plants on earth will make them extremely sick or even kill them. So there are so many different types of poisons out there that are very, very different. And, you know, you'll have, you know, some sort of mixed cover as you go for certain families of plants, but, you know, there are 340,000 different plants in the world and they all use very different defenses to stop animals from eating them. And so, you know, they would, you know, whoever wants to prove that these things are actually of benefit to you in a certain dose, they're going to really have to show that with you know, probably tens of thousands, if not more of different kinds of poisons and show me exactly what kind of dose that is. You know, I don't, I don't think that that's true, but I certainly know that there's no evidence to suggest it's true. I mean, people yeah. out here are drinking red wine and chocolate because studies said that, you know, it has antioxidants in it that are really helpful. So yeah we're, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah and, and what I point out to people is like, yeah, there's some antioxidants in there too, but there are a lot more oxidants, you know, there are a lot more things that will cause free radical and oxidative stress in your body than the few free radical, you know, the few, uh, antioxidants, uh, they just get completely washed over. And, and, and again, that's a perfect example of one of these really dumb studies that, that, that concludes something that is completely off base. And it's cherry picking, isn't it? Because you, you're looking at the one thing, the one feature that you want to talk about, forgetting all the rest of it. You know, like talking about, um, you know, the, yeah, these are you know, talking, you, you can't talk about the, the antioxidants in wine without talking about the alcohol in wine and the tannins and all the other, other sorts of, uh, you know, toxins in there. Like, how can you possibly do that? You are, you are purposefully misleading people. Well, I want to know who was this professor you had and wait, what division was that in? I mean, why is that information that he was teaching, like not 
available everywhere. I mean, I took biology. I, you know, was getting my PhD in anthropology and I did a lot of uh, courses on, um, uh, you know, physical anthropology. Uh, you know, we, we studied all kinds of things about evolution. And, you know, I barely learned about Lorraine Cordain uh, or Lauren Cordain back in the day, you know, talking about eating, you know, um, well, I mean, basically our, you know, ancestors eating, um, uh, a low carb diet. So why, I mean, how is this information like not out there? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, it, it, most of it re resides in, in the field of botany and there, and this is certainly something that anyone can look up in any sort of introductory botany book, because this is, this is just how plants behave. And this is, this is behavior between plants and animals. And I remember hearing that as sort of just an, an offhand remark when I was, you know, taking biology early on, and you know, just talking about that, um, but then, you know, at the same time, you know, being told that, you know, I needed to eat salad, which I hated, and, you know, and we, and we sort of forget that. But, um, you know, I've, I've, I've since gone in and started studying more uh, botany, and it's just, it's just, there's just textbook after textbook after textbook full of this stuff. Um, there's, um, and there's, there's, you know, videos online as well. I can send you a guy. Um, he's a professor of botany in, uh, Texas. I've, yeah, maybe Texas, Austin. Anyway, he, he did this whole lecture, just, just talking about all the different, you know, toxins and ways that, that plants defend themselves. Very, very interesting. And he's a professor of botany. He's written books on the subject and, uh, and, and many studies said, and this is, this is something that you can look up in any botany textbook. And I've had people because, I mean, not many people study botany. Like I loved bio biology, you know, it sounds like you did as well. I, I really didn't take botany classes and, uh, and uh, I don't know too many people that did um, who didn't have to. And, but I've had a lot of people who have, you know, since, since I've talked about these sorts of things, you know, email me or message me or, you know, comment on videos uh, be like, oh yeah, actually, you know, I took, you know, uh, you know, botany in, in college and like, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, ex that's exactly how these things behave. And, you know, and, and so it, it is out there. It's just not, it's not, not widely known just because there have been such a, a market push for plant-based products. And I mean, just going back, you know, probably a century with, you know, like Kellogg's from Kellogg's cereal, really pushing that. And that was an interesting one too. I don't know if you know the history of the Seventh-day Adventists and, and, and Dr. Kellogg, but yeah, he, they, they pushed for a vegan diet because they wanted to suppress people's natural libido and virility. And they said, oh, we got it. That's a, that's a horrible, that's one of the, you know, the deadly sins. We just want to get rid of that. And so we want to suppress this. And this is why they pushed cornflakes and a plant-based uh, diet or even a vegan diet. And, um, and he was also the one that, that tried, you know, that, that convinced everyone that it was, um, it was a health benefit to circumcise young boys in America, which is unique to America. Most of Europe or most of the world doesn't do that. And uh, there is no real health benefit as long as you practice proper hygiene. And so that was just a way of, of preventing people from fornicating and masturbating because he just, I guess, was just up at night, you know, just really just worked up about people uh, out there doing their thing. So then you have, you know, these food industries and sugar and the sugar industries that make literally trillions of dollars a year. The sugar industry makes about $1.3 trillion a year. And so there's a, there's a, there's a large vested interest in making us think and believe that, that plants are just, just the way to go. And a lot of that was, you know, based on, you know, the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease. And that changed everything. And we actually tr back, you know, track this back. And the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, they published uh, reports uh, and studies back in 2015 from, you know, back in like the 60s, detailing how from the, the sugar company's own internal memo, the, the own actual documents from their company, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol was causing heart disease when it was really sugar and to say that sugar was safe and just an empty calorie. That's where that stupid phrase comes from. It's not an empty calorie. It's things poison, absolutely toxic. One of those professors was named head of the USDA and it was he who authored and pushed the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol causes heart disease. So he was, he was a bought and paid for a shill. Another one was Ansel Keys, who I think was out of University of Minnesota or something like that. 
he came up with the RDAs, uh, the recommended daily allowances. So he was quite a well-known doctor. He did this thing called the Seven Nation Study, where he went all over the world and got all this data about cholesterol and heart disease. And he found that these seven nations, is, as you get more and more cholesterol, you get more and more heart disease. And it's parabolic curve. So it's exponential growth. The more cholesterol, the more heart disease. And it's called the Seven Nation Study specifically because he talked about seven nations. And those are the only nations in, that he looked at. But he collected complete data for, I think, something like 23 countries. And he cherry-picked the ones that fit that curve. If you look at the rest of the countries, it's just scattered. There isn't even a correlation between heart disease and cholesterol all the way back into, into the 60s. So, you know, this was fraud. It was based on fraud. And when you have the entire bodies of, of literature and, and academic thought and, and medical theory based on something fraudulent, you have to throw it all out and start from the beginning, which is what you know, I've been trying to do and other, other people uh, have been trying to do as well, because this is, this is in mainstream publications. This is, this is well-documented. This is, this is well-published and studied. There are, I've got, you know, I was in a debate on cholesterol with myself and, and, and basically five very well-renowned, uh, you know, cardiologists and, and me for some reason, I, you know, I'm not a cardiologist, but, you know, uh, I, I, I've spoken out about cholesterol. And so I was asked to do this. And so, you know, in, in prep for that, you know, I had something like, I don't know, 15, 20 studies that all showed very conclusively that there isn't even a correlation. And then we, we know the history that there wasn't ever anything to base that on. Uh, in any case. So there's been a very big war on food and health, and it's all been bought and paid for by, you know, various, uh, you know, influences and, and sugar and sugar industry for that case, but also just the food industry. This is a multi-trillion dollar industry, and they really don't care about your health. Very good way of pointing this out, Nestle. Nestle makes uh, baby formula. And they've been making this, I think, since the 70s. My parents have basically boycotted Nestle since the 70s because they found out they were doing this. They, Mine they too. Have, yeah, okay, great. Mine yeah, too. yeah, it's nasty stuff. They, you know, they went into, you know, third world countries in India and Africa. And, and, they, and they convinced people like, you know, we've, we have scientists that have found the, the best way we've scientifically perfected baby formula, any better than breast milk? I don't think so. But they convinced these poor people, and, and I mean poor in every sense of the word, they're destitute, a lot of these people. And they convinced them to spend what little money they had on baby formula instead of just breastfeeding their child, you know, exactly what, you know, nature intended. And the problem is, is they were very poor. And so a lot of these people ran out of money. And so they couldn't afford as much formula as the baby needed. So they just watered it down so they could give them more formula because now the mother's milk had dried up and they couldn't, couldn't breastfeed. And a lot of kids died. They starved to death. You know, they never needed to. They, this was something that, and, and these, these, these people were, you know, made even more impoverished and killed their children. I think that's some of the most despicable behavior that has ever been performed on, on humanity. And, and it's just for profit. So, you know, these people are really not your friends and they really just want to make a buck and they want to keep people controlled and buying their product and having, you know, control over, over what people eat. And, and it's just a massive, massive industry. And so, and these are the guys that are just pushing, pushing, pushing for- So how do we break yeah. through that? I mean, we as, you know, we as carnivores are starting to get, you know, the message but you know it's it's so hard to to i mean when there's this kind of money and this kind of marketing and this kind of education being put into what is the proper way to eat like how do we deal with that well i think if we just keep doing uh you know what you and i are doing now which is talking about it and showing the evidence and actually showing real evidence as opposed to you know just making making unsubstantiated claims and you know and, and we are fighting against uh, you know uh, a a big force because I mean, look at, you know, the game changers documentary, that, that piece of documentary, you know, it was, just, it was just a, it was just a 90 minute commercial for James Cameron's pea protein company. I mean, the guy owns $140 million worth of a pea protein company, you know, I mean, that, that's all this was, it was just, it was just a way to, to pitch his product and it was complete garbage. And unfortunately, a lot of people were really swayed by that. And, 
it, you know, I watched that and I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, I've, I've known doctors who were looking at it going, wow, oh, okay. Because they, and then I point out simple things and I'm like, yeah, actually that's really dumb. I, I didn't think about it like that. And they, they know better, but they were swayed, you know, by the showmanship of it. Um, but I think that, that this is, this is getting a lot of traction, you know, four or five years ago when I sort of, you know, rediscovered all this, I didn't really see anybody talking about this apart from, you know, maybe Sean Baker. And, and now there's so many voices, there's so many people like yourself, and I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of join the fray as well, um, that, are, that are, are getting this message out and getting more people following them because it, is, it does work and it is true. And I think eventually the truth will out and it's, it's slowly building. And I think we're about to hit sort of a, you know, a point that it's going to have to hit the mainstream evidenced by the fact that Harvard had to do a, a, you know, a large study looking at like, okay, this is making a lot of noise. People are making a lot of claims about good health. Let's take a look. And it's, it's a virgin territory for, for research, current research anyway. I mean, there's, there's literally a hundred plus years of, of research on this. If you just go back in the literature, it's tons of stuff, tons of it. Um, but you know, now they're starting to do that. And now you, you could really make your name uh, as, a, as a researcher if you started going into this. And I think that's going to attract a lot of people because the, the Harvard study, pre, the preliminary har findings of the Harvard study were, were fantastic. It was like a, literally 100% of people found improvements, significant improvements from, from major diseases. Uh, by going carnivore, 100% out of 2,000 people. So I think that's that's going to make people take notice. You know, I think three years ago when I moved to Perth, Australia, no one had heard of a carnivore diet here. And I mean, people literally were upset at me for like for what I did uh, because it was, the vegan push was so big here. And you know, now I talk to people and I just be like, oh yeah, I just do. You know, they're like, oh, you eat a lot of meat. And I was like, oh yeah, I just do carnivore. They're like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, my brother does that. Or you know, my cousin does that, or something. Someone does that. They know someone that does, and and they they know it by name now. They know what it is. Where as before, I sort of tell people that, and they just look like I had nine heads. They're like, "What the hell is this guy talking about?" Yeah. So I think it is gaining traction, and I think that as long as people keep talking about it, and and keep going with it, I mean, it, the facts are there, the evidence is there, and as long as people keep bringing it forward and and making it known to people, uh, I think I think it will eventually you know, hit, hit the mainstream. I think probably five, 10 years, I think this is going to be a very mainstream uh, way of eating. I think. I hope. I hope so. I mean, I, I really do try to, you know, promote it and to talk to people about it because I've seen so many benefits in uh, particularly in the black community, so many benefits, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so many people who've been like on high blood pressure medication yeah. for years. And then inside I do a, a three week challenge um, every month and just kind of helping people get started on carnivore and have the community and the support they need to stick with it. And then inside of uh, three weeks, I mean, and often less people, their blood pressure is normal. And yeah. that is huge, you know, to be yeah. spending years of, you know, money each month on blood pressure medication, on um, diabetic, you know, medication, and to just be able to stop doing that in such a short time period is amazing. But yeah. I, I wanted to ask you more about that. And actually, I'm really glad that you raised um, that stuff about Nestle because, you know, right now there's such a push to push veganism in the Black community. And in terms of the number of people deciding to pick it up, it is, um, it is growing, you know, much faster in the Black community than it is in the white community. And I think it, in the United States anyway. And, um, and I think it seems to be particularly, you know, hard on us. So are you, were you aware of that? And what do you think? And, you know, and is this just another money grab? Like, you know, people yeah. selling their products? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely is a, a money grab. And, you know, there, there have been historical, uh, you know, examples of, you know, a, an oppressive sort of nation trying to weaken a population by, by uh, you know, taking away meat and not having meat available to them. So there might be something uh, insidious going on there to try to, to sort of weaken people and make them more malleable and easy to control. I don't know. I don't know what, who, what people's intentions are, but that's, that is something that has happened historically. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't know that uh, the veganism was, was making such a, a rise uh, in the black community. I think it's, I think it's, I've, I've certainly seen, 
you know, in, in recent years, it, it, it rising in, in general and people becoming more and more accepting of it and not even accepting, but, you know, uh, very militant about it because that's something that it uh, fosters that sort of idea that, that you have to do this or you're a bad person. And uh, I think that it's, it's very, very important, uh, as you say, um, because, you know, the, these diseases that, that we call chronic diseases, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, even, even most cancers, Alzheimer's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think these are actually you know, diseases as we would traditionally think of them, you know, like tuberculosis or something like that, um, or Huntington's disease. You know, these, these are things that don't need to exist. I think these are actually toxicities, you know, that they're, they're toxicities and malnutrition, toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition. And so you get, you know, you know too many plants, not enough uh, meat, and then you get specific specific diseases. I think that, you know, diabetes is not really a disease. I think it's, you know, carbohydrate and sugar poisoning, basically. Heart disease is also uh, being, being seen more as a state of, of chronic hyperinsulinemia. So chronic high levels of insulin are, are a major driver of high blood pressure. So exactly as you're saying, you put people on a low carbohydrate, preferably carnivore diet, and in a few weeks, their insulin, you know, in a day, their insulin drops down to a more normal level and then consistently stays lower. The blood pressure is going to come down as well. Their diabetes is going to go away. And type 1 diabetes will even be you know, much easier to control. People with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia will actually start to pick, perk up because now their brain is running on ketones, which it prefers to do anyway. That's its primary uh, food source. People say that it's glucose. It's absolutely is not. I, I mean, I learned that in biochemistry, you know, 23 years ago, that the brain always runs on ketones. It doesn't always run on glucose. And in fact, some of your astrocytes in your brain actually make glucose. And you have you have glucose in your bloodstream anyway. You make blood sugar. Your liver makes it constantly. So you you always have, you know, good levels of, of blood sugar. But now you also have ketones. And so if you have peripheral insulin resistance, which is what type two diabetes is, even to a small degree that insulin resistance also affects your brain. So your brain's not getting enough energy if you're eating carbohydrates, but then you switch over to a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet, and your brain is now running on ketones, which is what, is what it wants to do anyway. And your brain is made out of you know, fatty acids, you know, very long chain fatty acids, DHA, EPA as well. All these things don't exist in plants. And so you have to get them from their source. And so we're not getting enough of these nutrients and our brain's degrading. Um, to your point, I think this is, you know, very, very important for uh, the black community, especially because just, just from our genetic heritage, European populations and some Asian populations, other populations have had the, the agricultural revolution more recently, or sorry, sorry, going back further and other populations have had it more recently. Good example of that is uh, the Australian Aboriginals. They really have only been, uh, you know, had access to Western food and sugar and alcohol and bread within the last couple of centuries, even, even in the early explorers in the 1600s, 1700s, they, they really didn't want anything to do with it. It's a, it's a more recent uh, addition to their diet. They get very, very sick. You know, here in the hospitals, one of the first things I learned is that when you have a, a, a native uh, patient that comes in, whatever their age is, just add 20 to it because they age so much faster, they get diseases so much faster. And you just have to consider a 40 year old as a 60 year old or a 60 wow. year old as an 80 year old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the thing, you know, we have a genetic predisposition and environmental trigger, you know, so we can have people can be genetically predisposed to Crohn's or rheumatoid arthritis or, or diabetes or heart disease, but if they don't get the environmental trigger, they will never get the disease. And so there are some populations that have had, you know, agricultural revolution about 8,000 years ago have picked up some defenses, you know, and, but that's not a complete uh, immunity. It's just a, a defense. So you'll still get the toxicity. You'll just get it at a slightly lower rate that the native Australians get this stuff very fast because they just, they don't have really any genetic protections against these. So they just get hit with it. Whereas, you know, you know, even you or I would, would have much more defense uh, against that. I remember as a kid, um, I remember learning that Native Americans, when eating a Western diet, were four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the other, you know, chronic diseases. And I remember thinking, 
even back then, I was like, well, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? You know, because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And, you know, we eat the food and we get the disease, we just get it at a lower rate. And so, you know, and what is a, what is a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? They didn't t- say it at the time, but the answer was that they were on pure, they were pure high fat carnivores. And so, you know, and you know, think of the Inuits up in, you know, Northern uh, Alaska and Canada uh, and Greenland. These guys are just eating, you know, seals and blubber and, you know, they, you know, they don't get any heart disease when eating that diet and they don't have any plants around at all ever. You know, so they really, you know, don't have uh, any protections against these. And then they, you know, come in the cities and they're just, you know, living as, as uh, anyone would in a city, they get very, very sick. And so a lot of these studies saying that, well, actually, you know, the Inuits have a lot of heart disease and a lot of diabetes. Those are the ones living in the cities and eating Western food. And the point is, it's not the genetic population, it's, you know, the, the diet. And, and there are things that, you know, we, we see in, in medicine, like, you know, uh, African-American populations are, you have a greater tendency for, you know, things like diabetes and, and heart disease and, um, and uh, high blood pressure. And it can very well be that, you know, uh, that there are, they are more susceptible to these poisons in plants. And so I think going on a, you know, towards a vegan uh, diet is, is going to be very, very detrimental uh, to people's health. Now, if you do it as a whole food sort of vegan attempt and you're not eating processed crap and you're not getting a bunch of sugar and you're not doing a bunch of processed grains, like you can do it in a healthier manner. And, and maybe even confer some benefits if you were eating a really crap diet full of processed junk with a bunch of sugar and, and uh, processed grains in it, then yeah, maybe going to a whole food vegan diet would actually you know benefit you in a way. And so they see these early uh, uh, improvements and they go like, wow, you know, this must really be onto something. But you know, it's it's uh, you know it's fool's gold. It's going to be gone in the morning because then you know they, these toxins will build up and they won't have the requisite nutrients because it, I mean, they're just, they're just deficient. There's, there's dozens of different, you know, essential nutrients that just don't exist in plants. And, and that's going to add up. It's going to add up and it's going to take a toll. Mm-hmm. You said some things in there that were really interesting. Um, one, uh, just as an aside, like a lot of times people ask me when they're like trying to lose weight about whether they can just eat lean carnivore as a way of um, forcing their body to just kind of go through its own body fat. And I feel like um, intellectually that makes sense. But whenever I see it in practice, it tends to lead to binges and just people not feeling great. But now based off what you just said, it was like, oh, of course, you know, the fat that we eat is full of nutrients. And if you're not eating it, you know, you can get the the calories from your body fat, but you can't get the nutrients. And, you know, maybe that's it right there. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look, if you look at animals in the wild, you know, the, the animal kingdom really runs on fat and, uh, and you know, most animals get around 70 to 80% of their calories from saturated fat carnivores, because they eat animals with fat and they go for the fat first is why, you know, they'll, they'll go for the stomach muscles, you know, you know, bacon is, is, you know, belly fat or belly, belly, uh, of the pig. And, uh, and there's a lot of, and they go for organs, but there's a lot of fat in the abdomen. There's a lot of fat around the organs. This is where the, this is where the majority of fat uh, on an animal is, is is in that, and so they eat a lot of fat um, in the wild, and um, and then but also herbivores because herbivores the way they get their energy is by breaking down uh, cellulose fiber. Right, we're told to eat fiber because we can't absorb it. We can't break it down. That's actually very very hard evidence that we're not an herbivore because we cannot break down fiber like a gorilla can, like a chimpanzee can. We have an appendix, small vestigial organ, used to be a four foot long cecum. And that's where fiber would pack into and break down into, in fact, short chain fatty acids because there no vertebrate animal can actually break down fiber. And so what, what these uh, herbivores do is they actually farm and culture certain bacteria in their gut, which eat the fiber. And as a waste product, they make short chain fatty acids, which are 100% saturated. And that's what the animal actually absorbs. So they eat fiber, but they actually absorb fat. And then the bacteria dies off 
and they you know break that down and 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 absorb that in as protein. So they get fat and protein. So a gorilla that just eats green leaves gets about seventy percent of its calories from saturated fat. A cow just eating grass gets around eighty percent because they're more efficient at it. So fat makes the world of uh, the animal kingdom go round, and there are very very essential. Uh, vitamins and nutrients, and even just fats, essential fatty acids. Like I was mentioning, our brain is made out of very long chain fatty acids, 20 and 22 chain fatty acids. These things simply do not exist in the plant or fungus kingdom, and we don't really make it. And so if you want this for your brain to build, especially for children building their brain, but then as adults and especially elderly adults to maintain their brain so it doesn't atrophy and shrink away and die off and get dementia, and other sorts of you know, really, really you know, nasty uh, uh, neurodegenerative processes, you need to eat these fats. Uh, DHA, which I mentioned before, you know, 20% of the solid matter of your brain is fats, lipids. 20% of that is DHA. You need DHA. This is why they call fish brain food because there's a lot of DHA in it. And it's not a saturated fat, so it's okay to eat because only saturated fats were the bad ones, right? So, you know, there are so many vital, vital nutrients in, in fat. I mean, just cholesterol itself is, is the precursor to almost every major hormone in your body, including estrogen, progestogens, testosterone, mineralocorticoids, and glucocorticoids. These, this is essential for life. Every single cell in your body, the membrane is cholesterol. Your bile is, has a cholesterol component. That's how your body absorbs fat. And, and the example I, I pose to people is, um, or the example that you know, I, I tell people is that you want know, to say, well, oh, we really don't want fat. Okay, then if, if that's so bad for us and we don't want it, why do we have four organs working in concert just to absorb fat? Our liver makes bile. Bile is stored in our gallbladder. You have to have bile. Bile emulsifies fat to absorb it. So you, you need this. You, it's very, very, you can absorb some of it, but it's very difficult uh, for your body to absorb fat without bile, right? So liver makes it, gallbladder stores it. Your pancreas secretes, you know, lipases and different enzymes that break it down into, you know, more uh, digestible parts. And then your small intestine absorbs it, okay? You have four, four organs working in concert. Why would that exist if we didn't want fat? If fat wasn't really, really, really important, that wouldn't exist. And that wouldn't exist in essentially all, all animals. And so we know that this is very important. And, and we, we, we look at it and you look at the components of it. And actually all these things are, are extremely vital and necessary. And there's a thing called uh, protein poisons or protein sickness or, or rabbit sickness. Some people call it because they're, they're eating a bunch of rabbits. That's the only meat that they could have because, you know, the Lords or whatever wouldn't let them eat real meat and fat. And so the poor people were just eating rabbits and then they were eating, uh, you know, whatever crops that they were growing because that was what poor people had to do. You know, rich people ate rich food, rich fatty food. That's where that comes from. They were living longer. They were much healthier. The poor people had to, had to eat what they could get. And a lot of the meat that they could get were just rabbits and they weren't getting enough fat. They didn't have butter. They didn't have enough access to, to other fats and they would get very, very sick. And you can even, even die from this. It's um, around like over 40% of your total calories from protein, you start running into problems. And um, Stefanson, who's a polar explorer and a Harvard uh, uh, ethnologist, professor of ethnology, he described this as well. And people will get you know, voracious, just eating this lean meat voraciously, and they just keep eating, keep eating, keep eating, because they're, they're, they're just starving, because they're, they're, their bodies need nutrients that just aren't there or in very small amounts in this lean meat. So you, you just have to keep eating, keep eating. And these people waste away, and they get you know, serious uh, you know, deficiencies. And so the fat is very important. And we, are, we get told that fat makes you fat. You are what you eat. You eat fat, you get fat. But I've never seen people eat broccoli and turn into a broccoli. And so maybe that's not a one-to-one. -one. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's just in the, in has to do with the vilification of fat and cholesterol. And in the 1980s, they, oh, fat busters, oh, bust the fat, get rid of the fat, all this sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's just a part of that, that whole propaganda scheme. Fat does not make you fat. Fat makes you lean, strong, and healthy. I've talked to, you know, many, uh, you know, native aboriginals here in Australia, you know, and, and just talking to them and talking about, uh, you know, my views on the matter. And, and a lot of them are like, yeah, you know, like when we, when I grew up as a kid, you know, like, you know, older population, when I grew up as a kid, you know, everyone was so skinny and so healthy and we never made any of this stuff. We just ate what we hunted. We just ate what we caught. 
and everyone was very was very very healthy and pe people live so much longer and such healthier lives we never really got these diseases that were everyone's getting now and and every single one of them would at some point tell me yeah like, and the most important part was the fat and i was like you're damn right it is you know it's absolutely important and so you know i i it's it's very strange to think about because you're eating something that's very calorically dense if nothing else but in fact it, it it's what your brain wants and so your your brain tells you we're good now you don't have to keep eating it's very satiating and so you end up not eating as much um, there are books written by doctors, you know, as far back as the, the late 1800s, I think it was like 1884. I forget the guy's name, um, like some German name, but he, it was, a, it was a book called, you know, like on, you know, weight loss and obesity and treating obesity. And one of the passages from it was talking about the things that you should eat. Don't eat any sugar or starchy, uh, uh, foods, no bread at all, you know, limit the amounts of, of greens and vegetables. You can eat any meat that you want especially fatty meat, because fatty meat is very satiating and you'll eat less and you'll lose weight. And so this is something that we've, we've known for a very long time. And yet, you know, we get, we get so inundated with the propaganda that we just believe it. And I, I was talking to someone the other day who had, you know, did their master's in nutrition and they were eating exactly as they, they learned in their master's, oh, this is how you should eat this. And she was just very unhealthy and she wasn't, you know, doing well. And so she started doing like all these different diets and yo-yo dieting. And she's like, you know, she's a nutritionist. You know, if, if what she's learning is correct, it should just be like, right, do this, you're done. But it wasn't. And so, you know, just, you know, as, as Richard Feynman, the physicist said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is. And it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so she's taught all this theory. This is how you're supposed to eat. This is how you're supposed to live. And yet when you do it in real life, it doesn't work. So it's wrong. And, you know, so, um, yeah. So that's so interesting that you have an opportunity to talk to the original, um, Aboriginal population. You're in Australia now, right? So yeah. that's, that's really interesting that, that you get to hear that. And one of the things, um, I mean, I often hear, well, or, you know, you read this, that uh, blackness itself is a risk factor for diabetes, which to mm. me sounds like lazy science. Um, and you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you at all, like why you get diabetes really. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, when I go to the doctor, or when people go to the doctor, I mean, there's no thought about like what, you know, what caused it and, and how you might turn it around. It's really just about here's this medication. So yeah. is there that same approach there with the Aboriginal population and, and how do they deal with it? I mean, is there a movement amongst their population to go back to, you know, the, the, their formative, you know, diet or, or what? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. Unfortunately, medicine has turned into, um, you know, instead of healthcare, it's just disease management. And, and so we're not actually looking at why, you know, type two diabetes rates have increased by six fold in the last 30 years. We just said like, yep, this is it. It was probably there all the time. We just didn't notice it. Diabetes is a devastating illness. You would absolutely know that it was there. Same with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. These things have all increased exponentially. And, and yet, you know, the people that really don't like to think just say, yeah, it was probably all happening. It was probably happening by the you know, exact same rate. Anyone who knows anyone who has had Crohn's disease knows that that is, that is absolutely uh, insane to think this is a, this is an awful awful disease to deal with you would notice when you're when you're having daily bloody diarrhea every single day and just crippled in pain like you're going to take notice and it's going to get checked off that someone is, is experiencing this um yeah unfortunately yeah, it's exactly the same. So, you know, you have someone who comes in and they have diabetes, they are treated for diabetes. They don't look at, you know, well, what's causing this? Why did that, why did that happen? Or heart, or, no one even questions, you know, the source of, of high blood pressure. They're just like, yeah, that's just a thing. There are ways of looking. There are some, some sort of conditions why you would have, you know, malignant hi hypertension. Uh, and those, are, you know, you might look for those. Um, but, you know, just normal hypertension? No, no, no one even thinks about it. Um, but we actually do know, we actually have, have very good evidence that this is, this is pushed by hyperinsulinemia. 
you know, put people on a keto diet, put people on a carnivore diet, it just goes away. You know, I see, I've seen, I see it in my patients all the time. I don't have a single patient on a carnivore diet who was on high blood pressure medication, not a single damn one, you know, and you know, the ones that are on autoimmune, uh, have autoimmune issues, they all come off. They all come off their medications for this. Um, but you know, that's, that's certainly where medicine could be, but it, it, it's not where it is. And right now you have, you know, the drivers of medicine are unfortunately, you know, drug companies and, and, and other, you know, you know, medical equipment technology, you know, technology companies that are trying to make something newer and bigger and better to treat some problem instead of looking at preventative medicine and looking at the root cause of things and why, you know, why it's a, it's becoming a problem now when it wasn't before. But I think that's what we need to move into. And that's, that's one of my major aims and hopes and goals to do is to address the underlying causes of these diseases and, and, and make everyone aware that these are not diseases and they are entirely preventable. You don't have to have them. You don't have to suffer with them. They will go away if you stop eating a certain way and your, your health will improve. And, you know, I, 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 I want to get medicine back to where it was a hundred years ago and had been for, you know, thousands of years, which was just basically treating five things, you know, like, you know, you know, pregnancy and, you know, childbirth and delivery, you know, congenital and genetic issues, infectious disease, um, you know, trauma, and then like poisonings, right? And now we have chronic disease and chronic disease is 85% of what we do. And, and we're just sort of, you know, it's just, just putting out smoke, it's blowing away the smoke, not even addressing the fire. We're just trying to make pe the smoke less noticeable. But I think that's really, you know, a larger part of, of the fifth, which is poisoning. I think we're being poisoned and we don't realize it. And so we're treating this the wrong way. We, you, don't, you don't treat lead poisoning by putting people on, a, on a, an agent that mitigates the effects of lead in your body so you can die slowly over 40 years. You know, you remove the lead and maybe you give medication like a chelating agent to, to you know, get this stuff out of your system, but you stop the exposure. If you have a, an exposure relationship, a poison exposure relationship, the most important thing is to remove the exposure. And so that's what we're not doing. We are, we are looking for novel drugs to treat the symptoms of being poisoned. And we're not removing the poison. This is like ancient Rome with, with lead pipes where they just had low grade lead poisoning for generations. And they just, they just saw people aging like this and like, oh, that's just how you age. And this is just what happens when you get older. And you know, someone figured out at some point, like, nope, that's not normal. That shouldn't be happening you know, what the hell's going on? They eventually figured it out, you know, but we're, we're in our, you know, lead pipes. We're in our, we're, this is our Roman lead pipes now with, with vegetables and carbohydrates. And we wow, just, that's we just, a really great analogy. Thank you. <laughs> that's really awesome. And I, it seems like the empire is going to collapse in a weird, awful way, the way it did with the yeah. Roman empire too. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, you did end up with leaders who are nuts, <laughs> which is yeah. one one problem with lead poisoning, right? That it impacts yeah. your brain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 Rome, and we, we might not even make it as long as Rome, unfortunately. But um, yeah, you know, but I, I think I think that this is very evidently what is happening, and that we can point this out, and and the more we point this out, and the more people are able to, to take charge of, of their own health. And I, I think that's something that appeals to most people and, you know, not being reliant on, you know, the healthcare system and doctors and medications, because it, it's, it's not a fun way to live, you know, waiting for appointment after appointment after appointment and just being on drugs and just really feeling awful the whole time and, and hoping, you know, I have, I have patients that, you know, we really can't help, you know, in, in neurosurgery and they have a lot of back pain and, and, and different issues uh, stemming from that. And what we're looking, we can only treat very certain things, you know, the, these surgeries are very beneficial for the things that they treat, but you know, if someone doesn't have that problem, you know, it doesn't help. And so, you know, there's one lady in particular this week who was, it was, it was, just, it was very you know, hard, you know, because I really felt for this lady because she was in so much pain and we really didn't have anything that we could offer her. She just had very bad back pain, which is, not surgical. It's just degenerative. You have arthritis in your back, just like any other joint carrying a little bit of extra weight. 
you're eating a bunch of food that's high, highly inflammatory, you're going to feel that pain a lot more. And so she was in that category and she was just like, so there's no solution. There's nothing I can do. You can't fix it. And it's just like, well, we can't fix everything. We don't have, you know, a, a, you know, a pill for everything. We don't have, you know, a surgery for everything. Unfortunately, I wish we did. That would be nice. But unfortunately, you know, if, you know, you have certain th- certain issues, you know, we, we can't fix those. And, and you have to, you know, like if you just smoke your whole life, your body's going to break down in certain ways that we can't fix. We can't put that back together. And so well, did you, you just, tell her to try smoke. carnivore? Did you tell her to so, try carnivore? Would you be allowed was, to do that? Yeah, well, you know, sometimes I do, and and I do point that out, and I did point out to her that there are a lot of foods that are that are very inflammatory and can cause more pain. It was it was through an interpreter and over the phone, so it was very difficult, and so I couldn't actually go into like a whole big spiel about it. Uh, but I, I absolutely do, I absolutely do talk to people about that when they're in that situation where we we don't have a surgery that can help them. I just point out that like actually, you know, the things that you eat can can dramatically change. Uh, the amount of pain that you feel. And, you know, like what I, you know, I tell people like when I work out, it doesn't matter how long it's been since I've worked out. It doesn't matter how much I work out. I, I cannot get sore. I just don't get sore. And that's because, you know, that soreness, that, that post-exercise soreness is actually from the inflammatory factors in plants that causing that pain, stiffness, and swelling and causing you to hurt as a way of telling you to back off don't eat me. I'm going to make you hurt. And so if you're, if you're a wild animal and you don't feel any, you know, muscle aches or soreness or pain, and you eat this plant and all of a sudden in 20 minutes, you're like, Oh my God, Oh, oh what, what the hell is that? You're not going to eat that plant again. And that's exactly how that works. And so I have that aversion, you know, I, I get people, you know, ask me, Oh, do you do dirty carnivore? Do you kind of do this? What? No, I am I'm just meat and water and I don't want anything else. And that's because when other little things slip in, it makes you feel like crap. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want that. And so the plants have, have, you know, they're, you know, they're, 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 you know, targeted, you know, camp ad campaign of don't eat me has, has absolutely sold me. I'm like, I don't want to eat you. I don't want anything to do with you. You know, thank you. Um, well, I was going to ask you, well, I was going to ask you exactly mm. about that. Like, what do you have? What about coffee, artificial sweetener? Mm dairy um some people have issues with eggs like what are your thoughts mm. around those yeah well I, I don't i definitely don't drink coffee uh because i had i had one cup of coffee and I'd, I'd been working out heavily uh really just to test you know why am i not getting sore because you know i just i've been doing humanitarian work in bangladesh and was you know as a volunteer doctor in the refugee camps there um helping the rohingya refugees who'd come over from burma there was like a like an actual genocide in 2017 uh, in Burma, they killed about 200,000 people in a month and a million people fled into Southern Bangladesh. And so they were very, uh, they're, you know, very hard pressed for, uh, you know, you know, medics. And uh, especially because, you know, ISIS was very uh, active in the area at the time, and they were, you know, targeting and killing uh, foreigners, and especially Americans, you know, they blew up a hotel because there was one American staying there, and were blowing up, you know, uh, uh, coffee shops and executing people. Uh, all over the place. And so it was very, it was very dangerous. And um, so I, I had been there for a few months and I came back and I was completely out of shape. And, but I just started back sort of doing a carnivore and really sort of discovering like, no, that that's what I was doing before. That was, and, and that's why I felt so amazing. You know, I, and I slipped off of that when I went to England. And so I just got rid of all the plants and all of a sudden I'm, I'm working out, I'm trying to get back into shape to play rugby again. And I just, I just wasn't getting sore. And I, I just thought like, oh man, I just not working out hard enough. So I, I really pushed myself and I, I just did like 32 sets of heavy legs. I did like 12 sets of heavy legs and I did 20 sets of squats. I just tried to wear out my legs. And I was just like, I'm, I'm just going to go until I wear out my legs because I figured like this last time I was like, well, you know, I, I did you know, like a big workout, but like, I wasn't like jello leg when I walked out of there like I would normally be. So maybe I'll push myself until I'm, I can't do any more and, and we'll see. And so I did, I ended up doing 32 sets. And, but I was, you know, I was actually, you know, um, I was listening to uh, Thomas Sowell at the time. I, I love Thomas Sowell. I don't know if you've come across him, but I mean, like, man, just brilliant. I love everything he's written. And so I was, I was listening, I was in a big kick, Thomas Sowell kick. I was listening to all his, his audio books and, um, and interviews on YouTube. And so I was just listening to one of his books on tape and I was just lifting. I was just doing set after set, after set, after set, after set. 
And eventually I sort of realized that like, I could just really just do this all night, but I had been there for four hours and I had things to do. So I was just like, okay, I should probably, you know, cap this off. And the next day I wasn't sore. I, I mean, I should have been crippled. You know, I've done stupid things like that before and, you know, not even to that degree and just been absolutely crippled and haven't been able to walk properly for a couple of weeks and really been in agony. I, I, it was like I hadn't done anything. Went hiking that day, went to rugby practice that night. The next day, still fine. The day after that, still fine. Usually two days after crazy workouts, you know, you're, that's when you're um, at the peak of your inflammatory cycle. I was fine. Went with a friend to Starbucks. And I was like, okay, let's try, let's try coffee. Let's see if that's something that my body can handle. One cup of black coffee within 20 minutes, my legs and back were just like stitched up. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, I could feel it happening in real time. And I was hey. just like, oh, that's not okay. That's not okay. I was sore for two days after that. I was like, no, thank you. I don't need oh. that. And so, yeah, you know, I've, I've just, I've had these things and, and they've sort of come in and I've seen how they react in my body and I don't like it. You know, some people, maybe they don't care. I do. It, you know, I, I like feeling my best and, um, you know, even just, you know, a bit of, you know, pepper or spices on something, you know, within 20 minutes, my nose gets stuffy. I get, you know, a bit itchy and like my asthma maybe, you know, creeps up for, you know, a couple hours. And it's just, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's annoying and I don't like it. And so I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, dairy rarely, you know, I, I don't, I don't think dairy's if, if you're okay with it, some people have problems with dairy. But, I do. Uh, yeah. I mean, my asthma was really uncontrolled when mm. I first started carnivore. And when I quit dairy, it was like, just like that, it was all gone. Nice. And I haven't yeah. used my asthma inhaler since, but oh, good. yeah. So I always yeah. tell people, try it just try going without the dairy and see what happens yeah any anytime you know i talk to someone and they're not having you know quite the results that they would expect or the results that you know they've seen me have you know i always try to try to find out exactly what they're eating apart from meat and water and there, there's usually something they're usually still having coffee especially with you know artificial sweeteners like uh, stevia um or you know god forbid like the sugar alcohols like sorbitol which is super bad and uh, and, and a lot of people ask, you know, why they're having, you know, such, such loose stools and bowel motions and they're drinking coffee with sorbitol in it, which is like both of those things cause diarrhea. So it's like, it's not really a question why you're having that, you know, but if you have all that, that, that out of there and you're only eating meat and water and no artificial sweeteners, nothing else, no coffee, uh, it's usually you're eating more fat than your body can absorb. And, and a lot of that's going out because you can't, you, you've used up all the bile that you have. And then the rest of it just goes out. And that's actually what keeps your, your stool soft. And so you know how much fat you're getting because if you're eating way more than your body can absorb, you'll have, you'll have loose running stools. And if you're not getting enough, you'll have dry hard stools because you're absorbing every ounce of that fat and it's not getting out into, the, into your stools and keeping those stools soft. And so that's what you want. You still want the same texture. You'll, you're gonna have much less waste because you're not eating a bunch of you know, sticks and fiber. So you're not going to have a lot of bulk but you know, you'll, you'll absorb about 98% of the meat that you eat. So very little will come out, but um, you'll still have some and you, and you want a bit of extra fat to go in there to keep it soft. Um, people can absolutely have a problem with dairy and eggs, like you say, especially the egg, egg whites. Uh, so when people have like autoimmune issues, I usually caution them to just stick to meat and water and egg yolks if they're gonna do eggs because they seem to be much more sensitive, especially people that have leaky gut from, you know, years of eating, uh, you know, gluten and, and lectins and different, uh, you know, issue, you know, different sorts of substances and plants that cause leaky gut, leaky gut. Uh, for those who don't know, there's an actual things called tight, tight junctions, tight vines between the cells in your enterocytes in your, in your intestine. And so they actually break apart. And so there's actually holes in between, you know, where the, the, the cells stick together. So it's actually a physical gap because one of the one of the barrier protections is it doesn't let molecules larger than a certain size through these little gaps. So it have to be very very small. And then there's like an electric you know electric charge, and so only certain things are allowed to pass through. And now when you break those gaps open, you know bigger molecules, things that have no business being in your body, can all of a sudden slip through. And so when people are healing from leaky gut, they can especially have more problem with things like dairy and egg whites. Uh, and then after a few months after that heals and that, that repairs, sometimes they're not as sensitive to that anymore because they, you know, they're not, it's not getting through those tight junctions. Uh, for some reason, people have 
uh, with autoimmune issues have more of a problem with things like chicken and pork as well. It may be because of something that the chicken and pork are being fed. I'm not sure, but that's something that, that uh, we do sort of see. So um, I think that the, the ideal diet would be like red meat, like beef and water. I think that's about as healthy as you can get. If it's you know, 100% grass fed, yellow fat, that's the, the key to uh, grass fed is that it, the fat should be yellow. Um, if it's white, then it's you know, not really 100% grass fed finished anyway. Um, but, you know, uh, but, but any meat is fine. And if, if people have meat that they prefer and they like, and it, and it tastes good and, and that's what they can afford, then, then that's totally fine. I, I like beef. I, I feel the best on beef, but I'll still eat eggs. I'll eat chicken sometimes and, and pork as well. Lamb, you know, any animal I'm fine with, but I, I do feel best on beef and especially grass fed beef. Well, there you have it, folks. This was a fascinating conversation. I hope you really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, this was um, a, a really unique conversation. I really haven't been able to have that many conversations specifically about how a carnivore diet, you know, impacts the black community or might be especially beneficial for us. So, you know, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Hampton and Dr. Cecily Ann and, uh, you know, and, and a couple of others who I've a actually been able to, to talk to about this and Ken Berry also, um, you know, touched on it. So, um, I want to keep having these conversations and I think that, um, you know, we have to keep asking these questions and forcing the issue because in the black community, we are really, really suffering. And, um, the standard advice about how to control diabetes and heart, high blood pressure is not working for us. So, um, if you're listening to this and you're struggling, you know, it's time to consider another approach because, you know, what, what we're being told is just not working. Um, so I want to see all of us healthy and well and thriving. So I want you to do whatever it takes to fight for your health because at the end of the day, you are your best advocate. All right. And uh, so stay tuned for next week. You're going to see part two and um, enjoy. Have a great week.